There will be a, a time for some questions, and I believe there are some roving microphones. And while you're getting the microphones sorted, I just wanted to briefly respond to your speech, High Commissioner. Uh, you did remind us about the indivisibility of, of rights itself, and it is clear that one of the major achievements is the institutional reaction to human rights violations in the United Nations system as a whole, uh, to its various treaty bodies, to the Human Rights Council. Uh, and as they grow more responsive, we find that the space for human rights violations, in fact, narrows. Uh, and one example very clearly of this is the success of the Universal Periodic Review that's brought states to become more and more accountable more recently. Uh, hiding behind principles of state sovereignty uh, seems to be uh, a smaller area in which a states can now use as a defense. And the second area of focus that I was going to comment on very briefly was your concern about freedom of expression, both in its uh, inherent value as a human right and some of the dangers that might lurk in that particular right. You drew uh, attention to, for the need to protect against this hate speech, which has been used to foment a great deal of human rights violations, for example, on this continent and in Europe. And I think you flagged a very important uh, potential harm of cybercrime and the collection of personal information through the internet and the challenges that it, bring, it brings to us. So I think it's a fabulous excursion of human rights achievements and challenges. So with the microphones in place now, can we now have a show of hands? There's one right in front here. Can we take this gentleman? And the High Commissioner will answer your question. Please keep your questions brief so that this gives us uh, enough time to answer as many as possible. Um, there are two things that I want to kind of bring attention to. One is legislation and one is the, the, the situation of Indian human rights when we talk about women especially. We're talking about the world's oldest country in discrimination, which is casteism. Obviously, I've been, I've been reading the reports of the Office of Residents, which is closely working on issues of caste. But, but when we talk about Dalit women, they are the world's most ignored and discriminated group because of caste, the religion, the group that clan they come from, and especially because of the women. So I just want to know what your plans are with regard to when you're talking about racism, how do you try to take caste as, 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 a, as, a, as an inspiring factor for your work? And second thing is when you talk about the challenges, I think uh, when, when, when I see other agencies of the United Nations, they are working very in, in a very globalized world where they have good ambassadors which are acting for them. Why don't you think the United Nations or your office can have a good ambassador to, to promote this thing which can reach to the, all the individuals very closely? Thank you. I would like to ask about um, the role of the United Nations, uh, in particular uh, your owner's office in terms of uh, institutionalized discrimination or institutional discrimination and also on globalization you you sounded as if you were advocating for the sustenance uh, of uh, economies in terms of land grabs uh, and um, um, uh, strikes that actually uh, discourage the growth of economies uh, so I would like to know, like, uh, does that have to come at all expense, even if uh, the benefits of such a, uh, a growing economy or a growth in the economy are actually not taken down to the uh, masses of the people, and it's only a few selected people benefiting from such a, a growth. Thank you very much. There are 7 billion people in the world, 6 billion living below the red line, 3 billion are starving at this point in time. I remember my debates with uh, John Humphreys, the founder of the uh, Airline University Declaration of Human Rights, and uh, I think James and also, uh, but I spent many years with Humphreys, and uh, we argued about the entire formation, who was behind forming this United Nations uh, from the League of Nations, what his objectives were, to what extent not Europeanness, but whiteism was a founding philosophy. 1% of the world owns 90% of the world's wealth. And since the Second World War, there is more human rights violations taking place around the world than before. So what am I saying here? I'm saying here that people are not in a worse condition now of course, I gave a lecture once to condemn the United Nations, the World Bank, IMF, considering that these are the agencies that have maintained the inequalities. When it comes
comes to Africa, we are Africans. We are not synthesized Europeans. And therefore, I would like to know if from you, now here, if any of those questions were during Natal days, what is the United Nations doing specifically with the United States now controlling or trying to control the entire economy of Africa? What have we considered that as a part of the equation? Because the human rights in Africa will never be achieved unless we are economically free. I have actually met groups who are subject to discrimination against caste in Nepal, in Japan, in those islands. Um, but India peculiarly thinks this word belongs to them, caste. And they have, uh, I know, have a political position that it should not be raised in international fora. Uh, they objected to my raising this whole issue when I was on mission in India, as if one wouldn't when you're standing in India. I was actually supporting the National Human Rights Commission in India that had raised the matter. Let me begin by saying that the Human Rights Council has done a lot of work, and the uh, minister from Nepal came to join the event. Uh, so we are addressing it, although I must uh, agree with you that we're not doing enough. That's what NGOs told me very recently on the question of caste. I will address it, but let me uh, uh, acknowledge immediately that actually of all the countries, India has done the most to address caste-based discrimination. There are very good laws, excellent jurisprudence from the Supreme Court. They have... Uh, people from uh, so-called so lower castes now sitting in government and being governors of states. So it's, it's a huge country. They have done their laws, but obviously they have to do much more because the system persists. Uh, a group of women who are the uh, condemned to clean the lavatories with their bare hands, and, and that's their job, whether they like it or not, came to see me. They went around breaking some of these latrines, and they brought me one of the bricks as a souvenir, and I have it displayed in my office. So let me say that, uh, as you said, India is a huge, well-established democracy, uh, but human rights must always be addressed. You can't rest on your laurels that you're an old, established democracy. Nobody knows it. Uh, nobody uh, knows it better than us that, and, and human rights actors on how we have to watch the situation all the time. So we will be taking up the issue specifically on the basis of caste. Now, why doesn't my office use goodwill ambassadors like other agencies do? Firstly, because they high maintenance. You know, I need money and a whole staff to look after these ambassadors like Angelina Jolie, and I don't know who else you were thinking of. <laughs> I don't think Madonna is there. <laughs> um, I feel we should be able to put out our messages so that it's clear and picked up and others can articulate it. We need to do that. We don't need movie stars or pretty faces to do that for us. But I do piggyback sometimes. <laughs> the High Commissioner for Refugees, who's my colleague in uh, Geneva, had a huge function, and he has Angelina Jolie as, as the Ambassador for Refugees, and he gave her an award. And it was reported in all the papers that the High Commissioner for Human Rights had given Angelina Jolie an award. <laughs> and uh, when I told him that gleefully, he said I owe him $100,000 for publicity. So, you know, our work is just so serious, we, we cannot have, uh, it's not publicity that we're looking for, we're looking to educate and we're looking to work together very closely with all of you. Uh, on the institutionalization of racism, except for apartheid South Africa, uh, there is no country in the world that actually institutionalizes racism. They practice it. There are countries, obviously, that have for instance, Maldives and Indonesia, who, who have in their constitution that they are 100% Muslim states, and nobody can uh, uh, acquire citizenship or any rights unless they're a Muslim. Israel, similarly, 
100% Jewish state and excludes everyone who is not Jewish. So very close to uh, racism, but there you are. It, it applies to religion in that particular case. I, have, I document incidences of racism, particularly in Europe. It's very rife. And, and against the indigenous people there, such as the Roma and travelers. And, and, and the only thing I could see is that they, are, they have darker skins than Europeans. So it's a very uh, a hot issue that I constantly raise with them. On globalization, it's a huge topic. I didn't mean to uh, uh, raise it as a full discussion, but just to say there's good and bad. We can't throw it out of the window, but that from a human rights point of view, we worry that the, um, it has caused uh, increased poverty, it, it has caused uh, rich and poor, it, there, is, there is land grabs, uh, I'm looking at the land reform of, of the new estate, South Sudan, and I very much fear that they're going the same route, it's what I call land grabs. You cannot take people's land away without their full and uh, free consent and full discussions. This is what the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People says. You touch our land, our water, you have to get our prior informed consent first. Um, so there's pros and cons on globalization. Um, I attribute this though, the, the rampant way in which it has uh, flourished, dominated by a few powerful countries. Uh, and, and the huge effect on the human rights of people all over the world. I'm very pleased to hear from Roger Raghavan. He didn't tell us who won that debate between the two of us. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm really very pleased and honored that you are here, Roger. And of course, as always, you care for issues as I do about poverty. Um, I'm going, we're going to make poverty eradication one of our priorities. We're just working on our priorities for the next four years, and this has to be addressed. Uh, and of course, you are right. There is no right, perhaps in this International Bill of Rights, uh, we're not on the right to be free of poverty, the right not to be poor. I'm bringing it under economic, social, and cultural rights. And I say I don't grade any rights. These rights are as important as every other right. Um, and you said you've condemned the UN IMF in your life. So remember, I'm here and us. Don't condemn us. We're already feeling the brunt of being targeted by terrorists and, and others. The UN uh, compound was attacked in uh, Central African Republic. And more recently, we lost uh, about 86 people in Jongli in, in South Sudan. So the UN is trying to do its best, but essentially, what is the UN? It is an intergovernmental body. The highest authority is the Security Council. The five uh, big powers, uh, including the United States, have a, 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 the veto power. So if there's anything that any one of those five do not wish to happen, then they veto it. Um, so it, it's, it's a system we have. There's been much criticism and calls for reform of the United Nations. You know, I have a limited mandate. I stick to human rights. I keep out of the politics. Uh, you mentioned IMF. You know, the current director, the head or president of IMF is um, of South Korean origin. He's a medical doctor. And we were all together at a meeting the other day. And if you see his CV, you'll see that he attacked and, and wanted the IMF to be destroyed. So today is the head of IMF, and he says his priority, yes, listen to this, his priority number one is eradication of poverty. Um, and I engage very briskly, of course, with him on human rights-based approach to all their policies. We'll do another round. I saw a hand here in the front. I want to take this opportunity uh, that, uh, to thank you on behalf of Tibetan people that I, I believe in my career you are the first High Commissioner of Human Rights who really spoke for Tibet and Tibetan people. 
and we appreciate for that. And as of today, as you know that 116 people committed self-commission because of the violation of human rights in Tibet. And uh, for that, you, uh, you made a very strong statement in the month of November, and we appreciate for that. Uh, today, among other things, you also mentioned about some mechanisms which you introduced, including the uh, rapid uh, response that has a violation of human rights. So I think uh, maybe please don't take it that I'm in Tibet and speaking for Tibet, but uh, many of our friends, uh, NGOs, civil society, they believe that Tibet is one of the worst a place where the human rights are systematically uh, violated by the, uh, by the court or the authority. So what kind of sort of mechanism we apply for to restore the human rights in the Tibet? Thank you. Thank you, the nuclear space now attempts to try to hold the states all corporations accountable because now also we spoke, we spoke we touched on migration. Now what happens that with that traditional diet that's taking place with the rules, the urban and the pocket of hunger are now beyond uh, what we would consider acceptable. Now additionally as well now there's a distinction between food security and the right to feed. So as South Africa for example is a food secure nation but then the downside to that is that there is pockets of hunger that are really really uh, so, if you could just share some light on Thank you. Um, I just want to ask, you mentioned that states have a responsibility to ensure that there's freedom of expression, and of course with that, no incitement to nature the violence. And you also mentioned that there are states who will not give citizen rights to those who, for example, would adhere to a different religion in an Islamic country. So you live in a country like Iran that proactively seeks to um, you know, create documentation, TV programs and such against religious minorities, for example, the Baha'i members of Iran. What recourse do citizens in that country whom the government proactively creates effort to incite hatred and violence against them, against them have? And also, what responsibility does the international community have to ensure that these countries who supposedly are adherent or have obligations with regards to international law, do not actually carry out those obligations, um, and you know, what can our governments be doing about it, or what should we, what should we be pushing for from them? Now, I'm beginning to believe what the Vice Chancellor said about this university. Um, and this is a spirit in which students should engage. You know, I've uh, obviously addressed many universities all over the world, I even uh, addressed the Pope's university, the Latvian university, and there were students studying religion from all over the world, and I was speaking about freedom of religion. And I said to them, the right to freedom of religion also means the right not to manifest any religion. So they were extremely shocked nobody had ever mentioned that in those halls. And, and this is why I really love engaging uh, with academics and with students because you pro provoke us into thinking and addressing issues that we ourselves have developed a practice to ignore or treat as difficult. So the next three questions I think have done exactly that. The question on uh, Tibet is uh, what everybody in the United Nations unfortunately treats as highly political because um, of sensitivity to the very powerful neighbor next door. I, uh, you are quite right, I issued the statement because this is why I took time to explain to you the, this mandate I have. Um, and I would be failing in my duty. I would not be able, I would not have a free conscience to face you today if I did not take up the uh, suffering of any individual or any group. And so I issued that statement following the uh, uh, an increased series of uh, cases of self-immolations and uh, uh, asked China, the uh, authorities, 
to open a dialogue and, and look into this matter because it's been going on for too long. Um, I did receive visits, obviously, from uh, China. The statement was not appreciated, but um, they understood that I have the right to do so, and I will continue to monitor the situation. I have, um, and you asked whether we could send our rapid response team into Tibet. Unfortunately, it is a very small team. Um, and as you can see, the two situations I described to you, Mali, for instance, we had to go there immediately because we were afraid of uh, um, retaliations. Um, so we actually sent three people there. But it's a good uh, question whether we, if a situation warrants it, we shouldn't uh, send our rapid response. Obviously, you know that they will not gain entry. So that's a big obstacle. Um, let me say to you, though, that I have an invitation from the Chinese government to visit China. Uh, it's been uh, several years, but I will be going this year. Uh, we're just fixing the dates. And part of my request says I want access to Tibet. I don't think that I would be blocked because they said, come and see for yourself how contented the Tibetans are. So I'm going to go and see for myself. You know, the right to food and right to poverty, both linked, um, should really, really concern us because the situation is getting dramatically worse. Let me say that in my office, we started off by endless efforts. My colleagues sat in endless meetings to get people, particularly within the United Nations, to use the right language. When I first went to World Health Association four years ago and spoke to Margaret Chan, my colleague there who heads it, and I said, we have, you have to talk in terms of right to health, and she said, oh, no, 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 I'll get into trouble with my board, meaning that one state you mentioned, Roger, um, because they're controlled by their board. So are UNDP on development. Now she speaks in terms of right to health, that it's a human right. Similarly, the right to food, we went to major conferences and put up amazing struggles to get that language in right to food. Because once we speak in terms of right, it's an entitlement, there's a corresponding obligation to prioritize and deliver on that. We know that I were just discussing during, uh, before we came here on how governments tend to use the word service. They're delivering a service. And at a very high level discussion, I pointed out the risk in, use, in us accepting service or charity uh, from the government and accepting just what they are willing to give us, whereas rights entitles you to claim in full and to participate in the decision makings with regard to right to food and security. So I assure you, this is our priority and we will continue to address it in the best way we can, we've worked very closely with the World Food Program and uh, the other organizations dealing with food. On, on Iran, uh, we contribute to the Secretary General's report on Iran. And you'll be surprised to know, it's just uh, a few hours ago that I pr approved our contribution because we monitor the situation in Iran, human rights situations, including the uh, harassment, intimidation, and imprisonment of people who practice the Baha'i faith. I'm very much in touch with them. Uh, they come from Iran to see me. Iran and its human rights record has been addressed not only in the UPR, but addressed in the General Assembly. And this is why there's a special independent expert on Iran, reporting on Iran. And I and the Secretary General I have to provide periodic reports on the human rights record of Iran. But I have an invitation from the government of Iran to come and visit. And there again, we're fixing the dates. 
Uh, I first sent a, a team ahead because we don't have an office there. And I wanted them to understand that when I come on mission, I have to go wherever I want to and see and talk to whoever I want to. And I will be critical. I'll acknowledge what I see has been done, but I will be critical. Now, that hasn't uh, quite been understood yet, so it's taking a bit of time to fix the date. But I assure you that I will be going to Iran. I've also laid a little other condition that I will not be wearing a headscarf. <laughs> You know, I learned that previous high commissioners were on the headscarf. The foreign minister of Switzerland wore a headscarf and was severely criticized by the whole of Switzerland. But I have explained that as high commissioner for human rights, my responsibility is to uphold uh, universal standards and non-discrimination against women. And therefore, I cannot myself uh, collaborate in any kind of discrimination. Thank you. I think uh, the High Commissioner has been pretty liberal with her time to us. So I think, I think you need to join me in thanking her very much for her time and for a fantastic talk tonight. Before we end the night, I thought we should present her at least with a token of our appreciation of your time that you had spent at WITS. And I call upon Ms. Lovelyn Bassey, who is the program coordinator of the International Human Rights Exchange, to present her with that gift. We need to the cameras. Thank you very much, Vinodi. I'm just checking what's given to you because I can't accept <laughs> gifts. <laughs> but I could display them in my office. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attendance tonight. I just have a very short announcement to make to thank a few people because an event like this doesn't take place of its own accord. Uh, the office of the Vice Chancellor for Finance and Operations, Professor Tawana Kupe, has been instrumental in ensuring that this event does take place, irrespective of whatever uh, costs might be involved. So I thank him. The Office of the High Commissioner in Geneva, especially the personal assistant to um, the High Commissioner, Ms. Cecilia Kinesa, and my gratitude to her because she recalled my previous invitation from another institution some five years ago to the High Commissioner, so that connection was made. Besides that, she's a superb organizer. <laughs> the Functions and Events Office at WITS, Ms. Reshma Laka Singh, and um, Ms. Michelle Gallant for your assistance. Thank you very much. <laughs> the WITS Communication Office in the person of uh, Ms. Sharona Patel and Ms. Butle Zuma. Both of them have been brilliant in giving us publicity for this event. Thank you. <laughs> the WITS Marketing Office, the WITS Central Printing Office, the WITS School of Social Sciences, the School of Law, WITS Theatre, IRI alumni, you'll see very many at the back waiting patiently in t-shirts that are identifiable. So if you lose your way on the WITS campus, they'll be able to help you. Thank you to all of you for your assistance and mainly to the audience for taking the time out to visit WITS for another engagement. Thank you very much. <laughs>